John, just, just to explain uh, who you are, uh, where perhaps you came from, uh, what brought you to the point of becoming a clergyman, and then I'll ask you another question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was free, so I'll try that. <laughs> um, great to be with you all. Lovely, lovely, lovely to be here. Um, my name's John. I'm a minister over at Emmanuel Church in South Croydon. I've been there the best part of two and a half years now with my wife, um, Claire, and our son, uh, who's now six months, Nathan. Uh, we, before that, we were in North London. Claire was serving a church in Wood Green. I was serving a church in Cockfosters uh, before we met and got married. Uh, through the lockdown, you can ask me more about that story uh, later. Um, and before, so we were serving those different places, we came together, lived in Woodbury for another year, and then moved here. Uh, further back than that, I, when I was 16, I felt a call from the Lord to, uh, to possibly be ordained. Um, and so I went to my minister, and he said the best bit of advice uh, that he gave was a great thing to think about go away, work for a few years, come back, and we'll talk about it. So, that's what I did. I worked for Marks and Spencer as a manager with them for a couple of years. Um, and then I worked for a youth unemployment charity in East London. Um, and then I went off to train for, for college. Is that? Fantastic. So were you brought up in a Christian home? I was. I was. My mum and my dad um, wanted us to follow Jesus. We went to different churches, actually in different parts of the world. We, I was um, in Brussels until I was two. And then, uh, sorry, I was in Brussels until I was six. I was in China until I was ten. Uh, Shanghai and Beijing, uh, worshipping into the denominational churches there, and then we came back to England, settled in Kent, and at a church there when I was in my early teens, I realised that the Lord Jesus died for me and I needed to put my life in his hands. Wow, yeah, thank you. Um, as a minister, um, you will go on, obviously, um, to be a vicar. What do you think is the most important thing to put across to your to your church family, to the people that you visit um, from your church, or people who you have contact with who really don't want much to know about Christianity. They're really dead against, or they might not be over in South Croydon, they might be down here. Yeah, no, there's a mixture, there's a mixture where we are as well, and some definitely are dead against. I think um, uh, it's a great question. There's so many things you could say. <laughs> I, I, would talk, I would talk about grace. There are so many people in our society who think church, Christian things, and they think rules, law, um, kill joy kind of God. And we've got a God of grace. We've got a God who sh whose son shed his own blood for us so that we can be freely forgiven and spend all of eternity praising him because of nothing that we've done, but because of everything he's done. Um, and grace is just... If you want one word, I think, to summarise our faith, it's grace. Um, so that's the that's what it's That's great. I'm going to stop there. Jesus saw the crowd and went up to a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Happy are those who are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble, they will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires, God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others, God will be merciful to them. Happy are those who are pure in heart, they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace, God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those sorry, happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. This is the word of the Lord.
King, we really want to thank you for being our King, for loving us so much that you would die for us, for loving us so much that you are our King and our Shepherd all through our lives. And we pray that you would shepherd ourselves now as we hear your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do grab a seat. Uh, we're going to look at one verse from that reading that Kim brought to us. My apologies that I didn't realise you used the good news, so I'm in the NIV, so it's slightly different language, uh, but we'll, we'll plow on with that. Um, now, I need one volunteer. You need to be happy uh, to be on the screen, I guess, and you need to be happy to drink some water. You don't have any lines, okay? That's all. You just need to be happy to drink some water. So, can I have a volunteer? This will really help us. Who's going to look at me? Yeah, you good. He's good. Oh, yeah, go. go on, man. Go on. One of us. Brilliant. Fantastic. Right. <laughs> now, remind me of that, brother. Charles. Now, Charles, you, uh, you just stand there. I'm going to uh, give you something in a minute. Uh, now, Charles, I want you to... Uh, I said there was no lights. There are no lights, but I, I want you to employ a bit of your acting skills here, yeah, okay? <laughs> so, you need to, Charles, pretend that you have been um, stuck in a hot desert for a whole day without food and water. Okay? So, I, I mean, try and express that on your face in some way. <laughs> oh no, I'm stuck in a hot desert. <laughs> <laughs> good on you, good on you. Uh, right now, uh, so, a hot desert all day, no food or water. Okay, now I'm going to give you this. Uh, imagine I've turned up and uh, I've given you this. You've, I've just turned up out of the blue. Now, I, I, I want you to bring, bring everything to this. Imagine you are absolutely, you know, you're parched. You've not drunk anything all day, okay? I want you to drink that water with that picture in mind. Okay? Go on. Hey, I'm actually parched. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 You'd drink it quickly, wouldn't you? Yeah. Good on you. Give him a round of applause well. Fantastic. Now, that's just going to keep that picture in mind. Somebody who's been stuck in a hot desert all day. And it's going to help us with our lesson for today from the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, the start of the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the blessed life. Now, he's describing um, how he lived. He's describing how his followers are to live. And it's this wonderful picture of a blessed life. Now, just like uh, Charles, our, our desert wandering friend, uh, hungry and thirsty in the desert, uh, we would be as well, wouldn't we, if we were, we were lost, uh, lost in a hot, dry desert. And maybe you've had that experience. Maybe, maybe actually today you're someone who, who has this experience of being hungry. Maybe you're someone who's, who's struggling. Maybe putting food on the table is a struggle. You, you understand this. You get this. If that's you, I know the church family here would love to would love to help and get the best help for you. But but some of us know this by experience, this sense of being hungry and thirsty. And Jesus knew that lots of the people he was speaking to had, had a similar experience. And he used this picture as he so often did uh, to teach them something about their relationship uh, with God. Now he says, Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. For they will be filled. Righteousness is a big word, it has a few different meanings, but in today's uh, passage, what it means is living in a way that pleases God. When we hunger and thirst for righteousness, he's saying we want to please God with the way uh, that we, we think, with the way that we speak, with the way that we act. And so we're just going to think uh, together uh, about that, those words uh, for a few minutes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Actually, do you want to repeat those words after me? I, just repeating words of the Bible is a great way of getting them into our minds. And these, this will be a wonderful sentence to take with us into the week. So I'm going to read the words again and then read them with me. And we'll do that a couple of times through the service just to get these words into our mind and hearts. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Again, together. Bless are those who come down first for righteousness, for they will be fulfilled. Great words. And to help us to think about those words, uh, I've got a question for us to consider. 
What do you do with your longings? What do you do with your longings? Now I ask that because I think Jesus is, is, is getting at that question a bit in this language of hungering and thirsting for something. See, we're all people with longings, deep uh, soul longings that need to be satisfied. Uh, longings that could feel like being in a hot desert, desperate for water and food. And Jesus is getting at those longings this morning. He says, he's talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And it will help us to think about that if we first compare it with some of the other things that we hunger and thirst for. Some of our other longings. Because my guess is that I'm not the only one this morning who, who doesn't always hunger and thirst for righteousness. That doesn't always describe my, my heart. Actually, I'm often hungering and thirsting for, for many other things. Trying to satisfy uh, the longings of my soul in places that I realise I can't deliver. So, um, as I was thinking about this this week, I was conscious that I have a particular longing in a moment. Uh, that, that, does, that never gets fully fulfilled. It's a longing to keep on top of things, okay? A, a longing to sort of somehow be in control of my environment. Now, as you can imagine, six-month-old son, a busy church, uh, it's very rare that I feel on top of things at the moment. And yet I've got this longing, and, I, and there's this disconnect. I'm feeling restless. And it's because I'm longing for something that won't deliver for me. Now, over the years, I've known many different longings, and I wonder what what they are for you this morning. Just to name a, a few things. Uh, it might be some of these, it might be something else entirely, but, but just to help us think it through. Maybe you are, you're trying to fulfill a longing through, through stuff, through possessions. Uh, if only I had this or that. Uh, maybe it's a, a new toy, maybe it's a, a new phone, uh, whatever it is. Could be all, any number of things, and you think they might satisfy the longings of the heart. But we know, don't we, deep down, that the next thing, when we do get it, it's just temporary. That feeling of satisfaction, and it doesn't itch at the soul. And it's the same with it's the same with success. Uh, perhaps you're longing to be successful in in some area of your life, maybe at work, at school. And you, each time you get the next bit of that success, you think it will deliver for you, and then it feels kind of like that longing is still unmet. The satisfaction is still out of reach. Or perhaps it's sex and relationships. You think, if I had the, the best family, friends, or romantic relationship, then, you know, the longing of the, of the soul would be, would be satisfied. And then, of course, something goes wrong in one of those relationships. So we, we let someone down. They let us down. And we realise, however good, even the best of relationships, never fully satisfy the soul in the way that we were made for. And so, let me just ask you this morning, what, what is the longing for you? It could be that, it could be something very different. What is the longing for you this morning? And... Ask yourself, why is it that that thing doesn't, doesn't ever quite satisfy? Why is it that I never feel fi full, filled in myself, even when I have those things? Well, is it not that those, those things can never fully and truly satisfy because they were never meant to? God never intended us to find complete fullness and satisfaction in those places. It's not that lots of those things aren't very good things in themselves, and that we can't derive real God-given joy from those things. We can, but, but I'm talking about the full, deep soul satisfaction that we all long for. And God didn't intend for those things to hold that for us. Just listen with me to some words from Isaiah 55. <coughs> Isaiah writes, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labour for that which does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. He talks about trying to spend our money, our energies on something that doesn't satisfy. So what is it this morning that you're longing for? Well, these words from Jesus are gonna redirect 
our longings this morning. Let, let's repeat them again. I'll, I'll say them and we'll follow them together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. the contrast. So he's talked about, uh, we thought about other longings for other things, and now we, we think about longing for righteousness. For righteousness. Now what is this, this righteousness? It's a word, as I mentioned, that means a number of different things in the Bible. Sometimes it means God's righteousness, God's perfect character. Other times it's talking about the righteousness that we get through faith in Jesus. So on our own, left to ourselves, outside of Jesus, we're not righteous. All of us try to live our own way, putting ourselves on the throne of our life rather than God on the throne. That's what the Bible will say. And that sense of not having our own righteousness means we need it from somewhere else. And the Bible says that Jesus' perfect life and his death on the cross made it possible for us to have his righteousness. What that means is that when God looks at us, if we've trusted in Jesus, he decides to declare us not guilty. Not on the basis of ourselves, but on the basis of Jesus' perfect life and his death. So he says to us that we're righteous. We're not guilty. That's what he's declared over us this morning, if we're in Christ, if we've trusted in Jesus, not guilty, righteous, even though we are, that's he's declared us to be. So it can be God's righteousness, it can be that righteousness, if you've not experienced that, I would love to talk to you, what does it mean to, to trust Christ and receive his righteousness? I know Norma or others would, would love to help uh, you think that through, but, but this, this, on, this morning we're thinking about a different kind of righteousness. Five times in this sermon, Jesus uses the word, and every time he's talking about moral righteousness. So godliness, holiness. So that's what this righteousness is. And what does it look like, then, to long for righteousness? Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, the, as you've been going through this series, the three Beatitudes that come before this, they're all talking about, in one sense, our spiritual, a place of spiritual emptiness. So the first one talks about being poor in spirit, which means acknowledging a sense of our spiritual bankruptcy in the sight of a holy God. A sense that on my own, I'm empty, on my own, I'm, I need his forgiveness. And then the next one talks about those who mourn. So those who recognise their spiritual bankruptcy before God, they, they therefore naturally, they are people who mourn over their sin. Their sin and the sin around them. And then, because of that, because they, they, they see their spiritual emptiness, because they mourn over that, they then, they then treat God and they treat others with meekness. They recognise that, that I should... I should have a right humility before God and therefore before other people as well. And so in one sense those three are all a picture of, of emptiness. Now those are good things for the Christian to reckon with. They're good things for us this morning. It's why we confess in our services, it's why confession is a, is a good thing for us to do in our Christian lives. It's not saying each time that we need to be fully forgiven again, that happens once for all on the cross. But each time we realise, Lord I've wandered from you. It's saying, bring me back to your ways. Remind me again of your forgiveness. Help me to go your way again. And, and, and so that's a good thing to do. But having emptied ourselves of our spiritual pride, we then, we then need to be filled with something else. And that's what Jesus is talking about here, being filled with righteousness. And he wants us to long for that. And he talked about that longing in terms of hungering and thirsting. And to help us with this, I'm going to give you a, a picture uh, of something. This is my dog. Oh. oh. <coughs> Struggling, yeah. Lovely, there we are, thanks so much. Uh, this is Nelly. Uh, Nelly, the lovely black Labrador. Uh, she's five and she she's she's a delight. But Nelly is a foodie, like a proper foodie. She loves her food. We have to take her out on a lead wherever we go. She eats things she, she shouldn't, um, but she absolutely loves her food. Now, what happens is her dinner time is meant to be sometime between four and five o'clock, okay? But um, invariably, every afternoon, if I'm in my study late in the afternoon, from about an hour before she should be eating, she begins to, uh, to, to make clear that that's what she wants to happen. 
So every time I go out of the room, even if I go to the bathroom, she'll follow, follow along with me and, uh, and kind of look in those kind of pleading eyes that only a, a dog, uh, dog can give and then follow me back to the bathroom and I'll sit down again and she'll come and sit here while I'm on my desk and, and she'll, she'll sit there just to make it clear that I haven't forgotten. That, that, she, that she needs it. So we'll, we'll hold her off for an hour or so and eventually we'll feed her. And then when she gets to the point, this is her in action the other day, this week. So um, so this is a great matter. If you have got a dog and you, you want one, this is a great way of slowing them down and letting them burn off some energy, especially if you take them for a walk that day. And uh, and she's just, I, I, in a way I wish I'd give her a video, she just throws her all into this. She's so hungry, she's so desperate for it that she's giving her all uh, to this moment. Now, there's just a little picture there, I think. A little picture of this sense of desperation. In fact, she's so desperate sometimes for it that we have to stop her part way through uh, so that she does, she, she gobble it all down and kind of get indigestion. But the picture that Jesus uses is hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's not just like a little bit hungry and thirsty. It's like I am absolutely desperate for food kind of hungry. I'll get, um, get rid of that, that's all right. Um, I, I'm desperate for food. I need this thing, Lord. That's the sense. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. One writer said this, there is a profound happiness in having a desperate hunger, a burning thirst for goodness. These are people who desire, he says, the whole thing, complete righteousness. The phrase breathes wholeheartedly. You hear what he says? A desperate hunger, a burning thirst for righteousness. And I wonder if that, that describes your experience at all. Because perhaps for, like me, sometimes that does describe your experience. You've got this deep down sort of sense of, of longing that can only be met in relationship with God and growing more like his son Jesus. But actually often as well, if I'm honest, if we're honest, that is, that's not the longing of our heart. Those are the kind of longings we talked about. They, they take a bigger place in our hearts than longing for God and for holiness. So what can help us with that this morning? What, what can help rekindle in us if we need it? And I needed it this week. A, a, a desperate kind of hunger and thirst for righteousness, for holiness. How can our other longings take second place beneath this longing? And the answer, I think, is prayer. In, in many ways, a very simple kind of prayer. There was a 19th century Scottish minister. Uh, his name was Robert Murray McShane. Uh, he's a great guy to look up and, uh, and, and read about his life. Uh, he exhibited such kind of godliness that was evident to people around him that even though he died at the, just at the age of 29, uh, where he ministered in Dundee, on the day of his funeral, there were 6,000 people lying in the streets because of the love and the affection that they had for him. A man of deep godliness, and it's therefore instructive to, to hear about some of the things that this man prayed. And here was one of his prayers. He said this, Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. Isn't that just a great prayer? Isn't that a great prayer for ourselves? I wonder if that's the sort of prayer you ever pray. Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. I've been challenged this week that um, I can spend a lot more time thinking that kind of prayer, praying that kind of prayer. Claire, my wife will tell you if she was here that um, I spent quite a lot of time thinking about food. <laughs> so um, we would have had uh, breakfast if we were out for a day off, uh, and I'll be thinking quite quickly, I'll be thinking about where. What time are we going to have lunch? You know, whatever, you know. And about mid morning, I'll just sort of, you know, give her a look and you know, just make clear that I'm still thinking about food and, you know, when it comes to lunch, <laughs> that needs to happen. I spend a lot of time thinking, I love my food. Our family loves our food. But if I spend even half my time thinking about where the next meal was, praying this kind of prayer, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? I wonder if that is the case at all for you. Or whatever it is that dominates a lot of time in your mind, turning some other thoughts to this kind of prayer. Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. So,
So just right now, in the silence of your hearts, I'd lo love to encourage you to pray that prayer for yourself. Just to think about those areas of life where you have those longings. Might be met in part, but never fully fulfilled. Those longings that, that, that can't satisfy at the deepest soul of you. Just think about what that longing is for you this morning. And however good that thing, pray that that longing might take its right place beneath a deeper longing for holiness. Lord, I spent so much time thinking about you could fill in the blank for yourself. Please reshape my longings to be about relationship with you, the pursuit of holiness. Do you know that is just the kind of prayer that God loves to answer? It's a kind of prayer that delights God's heart. And he's more than ready and willing to answer. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus said. And then comes the promise. And we'll end here. For they will be filled. You see, if we have a passionate desire that God kindles in our hearts for holiness, God promises to meet that desire in us. As we're filled with growing all of Jesus. Blessed indeed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I'm going to lead us uh, in a prayer now uh, for that in our own lives as we go uh, into the rest of our week. This is a prayer adapted from a, a wonderful Puritan prayer called Longings After God. Our dear Lord, Make it our prayer to long for nothing but yourself, nothing but holiness, nothing but union with your will. You have given us these desires and you alone can give us the thing desired. My soul longs for a relationship with you, for you to deal with my ongoing sin. How precious it is to have a clear sense of the mystery of godliness, of true holiness. What a blessedness to be like thee as much as it is possible for a creature to be like its creator. Lord, give me more of your likeness. Enlarge my soul, our souls, to contain fullness of holiness. Enlarge us to live more for you this week. And in the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the cross of Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, Let us shout for joy as we speak your name. 
Let your word which say, let me hear what God, the Lord, speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Lord, we know that you are a God of peace. And in our prayer, we bring to you situations both here and around the world where Satan is at work in many guises. For an end, we pray for an end to conflicts in countries known to you. We call on you, Lord, that you will show wisdom, show your authority, your grace, your compassion. We pray for a rest, for restoration for mind, body, and soul, and for infrastructure. Your word says, Restore us, O God, our, o your, o our salvation, and put away indignation to those over us. Father God, you walked this earth, you didn't walk alone. You chose followers who you instructed to be fishers of men. We thank you for those that you have sent and who those who have heeded your call. At this time, may we bring to you Donald and Becky and their children. We pray for Donald's teaching in Psalms, for the two Christian families at school, and for the completion of another school year with Ben and Elliot, for the summer English school that Becky is running. We pray that the last two modules of the pre for their preaching online. And dear God, we thank you for the work that Becky and Donald are doing. And we pray that you will fill Donald with wisdom as he works to support the local churches. Bless them and keep them safe. And Lord, we bring to you other agencies who provide resources to those in need. We thank you for all that they do. We pray especially for the work of Tear Fund. Help the workers to build churches. Help others to over and help others to overcome poverty and to build them up both physically and spiritually. Keep the workers safe and guide them as they do your work. Merciful God, we continue our prayers by lifting up our church families to you. Bless those who are going through financial hardship. Heal those who are undergoing health challenges. And for those who are bereaved, we ask your comforting arms to enfold them. Bless families with children. Give them your peace and help them that are struggling to manage the school holidays. We pray for safekeeping for children everywhere. And we pray especially for the families of those young children who were killed at their dance class. Give them their peace and draw them to you. Lord Jesus, we call on you to come as we need you right now. We know that Satan is always at work, but we know, Lord Jesus, that his weapons will never destroy us. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and we ask that you will accept these prayers for your dear Son, Jesus Christ.
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with that compassion for others this week, to share the love of Christ, and to do so with the holiness that we pray you would help us to long for. Lord, help us to be as holy as pardon sinners can be. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. Amen.